Good morning, New Hope. Y'all sound like you are really doing well. I apologize for interrupting your Saturday morning cartoons. This will probably just be more of the same, just a different channel. At least I hope so, because I love, I have fun with this stuff. So what we're going to be doing this morning in these three sessions is a little bit of this. I've been working really hard for 40 plus years on the teachings, the words of Jesus. Um, But in the last year, it's really been on my heart to look at some other aspects of him because, you know, there's more to him than simply what he teaches. There's, for example, his healing and deliverance ministry, right? There's another part of Jesus, just like with us, that's his relationship with God, his personal piety or devotional ministry or life, uh, part of his life. And so I've been looking at that pretty hard. If you want to uh, take a look at a really interesting article that nobody else writes about, uh, I, I turned this loose about a month or so ago. It's online. It's the prayers of Jesus. And it's not what he prayed, but how he prayed. And when I did the research for this article, and it took months and months and months, um, I was astounded at the stuff that I found. Uh, Not just in the life of Jesus, but how were people praying from the days of, for example, Abraham all the way through. So you you begin to to pick up uh, on... Yeah, it, these prayer practices, not just what they said, but how they're praying, beginning in about 1800 BC. And then 2,000 years later, Jesus comes along. And now 2,000 years later, you and I, who are supposed to be imitating this life of Christ, we come along. And it just fits together. So enjoy that. It's out there on the internet. You're welcome to it. So This morning, we're going to be looking at the healing ministry of Jesus, the delivering ministry of Jesus, and the resurrection ministry of Jesus. Three different sessions, not going to fit them all in in the first one, one for each. So now we're going to be looking at the healing ministry of Jesus. Basically, my primary premise is this. When Jesus came into his world, he was attractive he attracted people to him. He, he had a, a very winsome ministry. He was not someone who was a, a, a prickly cactus. He was not somebody who was a, 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 a scary figure. Children were attracted to him. Young and old were attracted to him. The, the needy were attracted to him. And so he doesn't come speaking a language or talking in ways that people can't understand. He doesn't come in ways that are off-putting. You know what I mean by that? Off-putting, you know, like repulsive. He's not a a, a polka-dotted, antennaed Martian, uh, not a scary figure. And we're going to see this in the healing ministry of Jesus, that he fits like the perfect picture puzzle piece that you needed to finish the puzzle and it was had fallen off the table, it was off in some corner down in a shadow or whatever, but it fits perfectly. He fits perfectly into his world, which is one of the reasons why he was so effective. Jesus' life changed this world forever. He is the hinge pin. We mark dates based on the coming of Jesus, right? Right? B.C. and A.D., he made a big splash in his time and also throughout the rest of the centuries. So let's just take a look at the healing ministry of Jesus as one example of this winsome, fits perfectly within his world kind of lifestyle and ministry uh, that Jesus had. Now, the purpose of miracle. This is big picture, and then we'll dial into the little picture. His purpose in working miracle was more or less threefold. First of all, Jesus was a person of compassion. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, this God that we serve is a God who is, um, in Hebrew, rav chesed ve'emet. 
full of covenant loyalty and steadfast love. You can translate that word just about any kind of way that you've got in your trend, modern translations. Covenant loyalty, steadfast love, loving kindness. This is what marks the nature of God. He is concerned about us. Another is to reveal his character. So if he demonstrates his character as being a very involved as opposed to a very detached God, as being one who knows our needs even before we express them verbally, that's showing us something about God and he's doing it in the miracle working ministry in his acts. It's not just words. It's not a sermon. He's acting in ways that display what's going on inside of him as a being. Uh, the same thing happens with us, by the way. The way we talk and the way we act indicates something that's going on on the inside. It's out of the abundance of the heart, right? Somebody taught that. Can't remember who, but it, it is, it's, it's out there somewhere. A third purpose of miracle is to institute or to further to advance the kingdom of God you see any time that God expresses his authority over nature or over disease or over the enemy or over our own ignorance or whatever he's demonstrating his kingship and so as he's demonstrating his kingship people are beginning to be attracted to that and the kingdom begins to grow but these are indeed these healing miracles of Jesus, the deliverance ministry that we'll talk about next hour, these are expressions of the kingdom moving forward. And people would recognize that it is, is that. If I cast out demons, the kingdom of God has come upon you. That sort of uh, approach to kingdom building, kingdom expansion or extension. So Jesus had an interesting way of healing, especially when compared to healing ministries that were going on before, during, and just after his ministry. He's one who could heal by the spoken word. He also was one who did not use some sort of a method or a modality, some sort of an incantation or uh, uh, things like um, uh, using magical roots or whatever, but he did sometimes choose to use a certain kind of modality like putting mud on a, on a blind man's eye or uh, allowing someone to touch his person, uh, the hem of his garment, or especially the laying on of hands. You've heard about it before. It's in the Bible. It's all over the place. We're even told in the church today, if anyone is sick, then let him call for the elders of the church and with the laying on of hands... Um, so this is the one that we're going to kind of pick at this morning, this business of the laying on of hands. When you think about it, it's, unless you're a chiropractor, it sounds weird, right? The, why would God choose that? And, and would that weird people out in the first century? It's, it doesn't happen in everyday life in our world. And so we think, well, boy, that's odd. That's bizarre. That would be off-putting for some person that I don't even know to put their hand, except the chiropractor, put their hands on me and, and for the purpose of physical healing. But the, it's probably the wrong question to ask. It's not, what would it feel like to me? How would, I, how would people in my world respond? It's like, what's going on in Jesus' day? So that's kind of what we want to look at uh, this, this morning in this first session. So a, a picture of Jesus receiving the children, a popular story, that, one that we, we quote, you know, let the children come unto me for such is the kingdom of God. But take a look at what Matthew says. Some of the children were brought to him so that he might lay his hands upon them. Man, you'd get arrested for that today. There's a word for that, right? Starts with a P, ends with an A. I'll let you fill in between. Laying hands on them and pray. Do you see the connection? praying and the laying on of hands, and the disciples rebuked them. The rest of the story you can read on your own. We're going to continue our survey. They were bringing children that he might, Mark says, touch them. 
Not just lay his hands on, but touch them. Luke says the same thing, that he might touch them. We also hear in the Gospel of Mark about um, uh, a a request that, that Jesus come to and minister to a little girl who is sick. She's at the point of death, Mark 5 says, and come and lay your hands on her so that for the purpose of, in order that, she might get well and live. Luke says, read similarly in, similarly in chapter 13. Uh, we get another one uh, uh, in Mark chapter 6, and this is Jesus ministering in his hometown of Nazareth. There it says he could do no miracle except he laid his hands on a few sick people and he healed them. Okay, laying hands and healing. There's this close connection between the two. Uh, you may remember this story Jesus uh, finds a man that was totally blind. And then he ministers healing to him. In what way? It says, taking the blind man by the hand, he brought him out of the village and after spitting on his eyes, and we do hear this, as as odd as that sounds to us, again, we would get arrested for assault. Come on. In our world, that would be, that's the commission of a crime. In Jesus' world, though, we hear about this in the early uh, works of the early rabbis that go back to the time of Jesus, that it is not odd or unusual. It was already recognized in the first century in the land of Israel that spit had healing properties. When's the last time, just think for a second, I know it's difficult on a Saturday morning, isn't it? We'll probably get, get there about the middle of the second session, I'm thinking. That's probably, that's me too. Uh, we, you can probably remember the last time that you, you know, got your finger caught in the door or hit your finger with a hammer or stuck your uh, finger with a pin trying to sew or something like that. And your first, incl- yes, exactly, inclination is to get that body part into your mouth. Is it okay to talk about stuff like this in church? All right, well, I take it back. <laughs> you, you unhear that anytime you want. Just erase the tape. But in Jesus' day, this was normal. How do we know this? It has been enshrined in ancient literature. It's there in black and white. It's like doing archaeology, but just in books. And you find something that illuminates, that enlightens us, our understanding of what ancient people thought or how they lived. And, and, and you go with that. And so it's in there. So spitting on his eyes and then laying hands upon him. Again, the connection between the laying on of hands and healing. He asked him, do you see anything? And so I'm skip just a little bit there uh, verse 24 but in verse 25 and again he laid hands this time it just doesn't say he laid his hands on him it says he laid his hands on his eyes now that, that sounds a little bit weird too and yet we have examples from the er- works of the early rabbis that w- at certain points when people needed physical healing A rabbi would come and he would lay his hands on the part that needed the healing, including things like your teeth. You know, say like open your mouth and say, ah, right? Now be healed in the name of the God of Israel or whatever. That's what was, that was happening. I'll show you one passage in rabbinic literature that says exactly that. He put his hands on his teeth. It's like, whoa, now we are really getting personal. I was chiropractor a minute ago, now it's dentist. Okay, so he lays his hands on his eyes, looked intently, and he was restored and began to see everything clearly. Hallelujah. I'm not that crazy about glasses, so I would be really good to go with this. In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, we get that portion at the very end that's describing the disciples of Jesus, the followers of Jesus. They will pick up serpents, and if they drink anything, any deadly poison, it won't hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So, in other words, the early church was imitating this healing ministry of Jesus, including modality or method or means. That is, 
The laying on of hands is the primary method. You see it more often in the ministry of Jesus than you see any of those other things, you know, like the touching the hem of the garment or uh, putting mud on people's eyes and that sort of thing. This is kind of the bread and butter of that healing ministry of Jesus. I, in a way, that's the reason I chose to focus on that instead of, well, you didn't like the spitting part anyway, right? So here in the book of Acts, we hear about people following this example of Jesus. Uh, in the um, situation with the, with the first set of deacons, they brought these people before Jesus, uh, before the apostles, and the apostles laid their hands on them. Uh, it's some kind of an, like an act of consecration, or I'm, I'm committing these people to God, to what he wants to do in their life, or uh, what he wants to do through them, etc. In the book of Acts, it says that when, and we'll talk about this on Sunday morning, tomorrow morning, when we're talking about the work of the book of Acts, the work of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. They, um, it says in this passage in Acts 8, that after Philip had preached the good news to non-Jews, these are Samaritans, these people had received the word of God, we're hearing in Acts 8, and they had been, even been baptized in water. It says that the uh, apostles, Peter and John, came down from Jerusalem. It's a couple of days journey and got to the capital city of Samaria, which is also called Samaria. I know that's hard to keep straight that the region and the city, the capital city of the region have the same name, but it, it is what it is. So I uh, can't change it now. I'm about 2,000 years too late. They began laying hands on them and these Samaritans recently saved we're receiving the Holy Spirit. Uh, again, we'll talk more about that tomorrow morning. Uh, in the book of Acts in chapter 9, we hear about this guy named Ananias, a Jewish man living in Damascus, which is the capital of Syria. And he got this revelation from God. You need to go and minister to this guy named Saul, Saul slash Paul. And so he goes and he says he lays his hands on Paul. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road uh, sent me that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So healing and spirit empowerment are coming via this modality, method, or means of uh, uh, bless, God blessing people using other people. In Acts 28, Paul is headed to Rome. He's on a ship uh, journey. He has a shipwreck and he's on an island and come to find out that the father of the governor of that island is dying of dysentery. I was going to say something, but I'm not. I know you're already there. Hey, this is okay because it's Saturday. I just made that up. <laughs> it was convenient. Okay, he had recurrent fever and dysentery. Paul went to see him, and after he prayed, he laid his hands on him. Hope you see by that, that in, in terms of sequence, that it makes no difference. Why is that? Because this business of God caring about us and God wanting to heal us and stuff like that is not about getting the formula right. Come on, New Hope. God's not about a formula. God's about a, a, a right heart, an open heart, an open attitude, and he is about meeting the needs of people. And we don't have to get the sequence right or hold our mouth just right or use the right Aramaic voice inflection to get from God because he is a good God, you know, right? He does, we don't have to kind of corral him and cajole him into doing what he delights to do already. I love that about the God that we serve, don't y'all? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Uh, that's right, you don't, you're not supposed to say that anymore. <laughs> you know, people are getting trouble in, in the military about that now. I just got a, got a report of a chaplain, an AG chaplain uh, in the military who got written up for saying, yes, ma'am, is what it is. First Timothy, I didn't come to talk about that stuff. <laughs> First Timothy chapter 4. Paul tells Timothy this, don't neglect the spiritual gift that is in you, 
through the um, uh, prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands. So again, there is, you get that kind of stuff in the church, early church. Don't lay hands on anyone too hastily. That is to bring them into gospel ministry. Uh, but we're still hearing about this business of laying hands as, as a way of consecrating or setting people apart and committing them to some kind of a special work of God that they need, whether it's healing or empowerment. Now, is, is this new? Is this something that the first century church just kind of dreamed up? And the answer is... Well, I'll let you look. In Genesis chapter 24, it's Abraham says, I want you to, to serve and I want you to come here and I want you to place your hand under my thigh. Hey, this is totally not my fault. It's y'all's Bible. <laughs> okay, I didn't make this up. It's, well, okay, it's Moses' fault. He's the one who wrote this. Put your hand under my thigh and I will make you swear by Yahweh, the God of heaven and the God of earth. Okay, so now we're taking some sort of an oath formula by physical touch. In the Genesis 48, it says, Jacob stretched his right hand out and laid it on the head of his son Ephraim. Uh, actually, it's his grandson. And crossed over and put his other hand on Manasseh another grandson through Joseph and crossing his hands although Manasseh was the firstborn so he's getting sort of like the second blessing of the left hand all right so now we're talking about kind of like what the apostles did to the first deacons uh, of what the presbytery did to Timothy etc cetera, etc cetera, of of, uh, of setting consecrating them for some sort of special uh, work or purpose or, or consecrating them to the work of God and then also being a channel of blessing where God is empowering them to be and do what he's calling them to be and do in the book of Exodus it talks about laying hands on an offering now, what's that about consecrating that offering no longer just a, a member of the flock or the herd out there but consecrating it directly to God for a special purpose and uh, for a sacrifice they didn't even get six months pastor you see what I did with that I got six months to live they had about six minutes to live when it gets to the laying on of hands part lay hands on the head of the bull Again, laying hands on a sacrificial animal. Laying hands on the head of the live goat. This is the um, uh, ritual of the Day of Atonement, Leviticus chapter 16. So this sacrificial animal that's going to bear the sins of the entire nation for an entire year. That's one important goat, y'all. Still trying to improve on this so that I get, um, I, I, I get a better score than the Saturday, Saturday morning cartoons. Okay, lay both hands on the head of the goat and lay them on the head of the goat and send him away into the wilderness bearing the sins of the people. Uh, present the Levites, just like the apostles did with the deacons, just like the presbytery uh, did with, uh, with Timothy. Present the Levites, these descendants of Levi. Uh, the priestly tribe uh, before the before Yahweh and the sons of Israel will lay hands on them okay this are you getting the idea that this is not new that, that this stuff is going on in uh, the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament and instead of just cooking up something just you know uh, some novel idea straight out of their head these guys in the early church, and Jesus included, they're following kind of a long chain of tradition that goes right back into the very beginnings of their Bible with people like Father Abraham. Numbers 27, take Joshua, the son of Nun, and the Lord is telling Moses, and lay hand, your hand on him. And he laid his hands, plural, on him and commit the laying on of hands and commissioned him we talked about being consecrated or set apart for some sort of special purpose um, and we hear in other texts that the spirit of the Lord was upon Joshua because of that action in other words God was working through Moses to bring empowerment to Joshua to accomplish what he was supposed to accomplish for the kingdom of God 
Okay, now we're going to move from the Hebrew Bible or what we call our Old Testament and we're going to move into that time period between the Testaments, you know, that nobody really reads about. We do, though, here at New Hope because what we found out about is that there is this unbroken chain, consistent um, kind of development that doesn't end in the Old Testament and then pick up again a brand new in the new, but there's this unbroken chain of godly people and people who are writing and folks who are prophesying, people who are being healed, people who are being divinely provided for and delivered and protected and stuff like that. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Help me out with that just a little bit. A little bit of Hebrews 13, 8 there going on. Uh, how about a little Malachi 3, 6? I am Yahweh. I do not change. So there is no break. There is no, you know, he took a vacation of 450 or 500 years. Same God all the way through. By the way, same God today. All right, so uh, the, there's this text that was discovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's the reason for the Q right there or Q right there or Q over here. You guys are working me to death up here, Pastor. Um, just... Now he says, so the Genesis Apocryphon is a text that's not biblical, but it's about Bible stuff. It's kind of like, I don't know, maybe somebody was using it as a, a Sunday school quarterly, a uh, Sabbath school quarterly, all right? And so it says there that none of the, it's a story of the life of Abraham, basically. Uh, none of the physicians or magicians or sages were able to heal uh, this, this guy, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. So this Harkonosh, the servant of Pharaoh, came to me, this is Abraham speaking, beseeching me, begging me to go to the king and pray for him and lay my hands upon him that he might live. So I prayed for him and I laid my hands on his head so that the scourge, this thing that was needed healing uh, on Pharaoh, would, uh, would be effectively dealt with, would depart uh, from him. So this is not just stopping in Old Testament times. This is a, t a text from the middle of the intertestamental period, probably early second century BC, maybe late third century BC. We're not exactly sure. Here's another text, and this is from the rabbis that, about Moses laying his hands on Joshua. It says there that Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom because Moses, because Moses had laid his hands upon him. In other words, the rabbis are interpreting that Old Testament passage and saying, yeah, he was commissioned for service. He was also here uh, empowered, quickened for service by this uh, work of God that manifested itself through the laying on of Moses' hands. Here we get another text. Elijah, the prophet. Elijah, of blessed memory, came before um, Rabbi Yehuda Nasi, disguised as Rabbi Chia the elder, and he laid hands upon his teeth and cured him. I told you it was coming, y'all. I warned you, you know, I got prepped you for this, and now we're there. Laid his hands on his teeth and cured him. Now you say, weird, right? They say normal about this business of the laying on of hands, the early church. Is that something totally weird and bizarre that only modern Pentecostals have cooked up? Maybe a few charismatics at the Tulsa crowd, the folks on TV? No. It's, it, it, it goes back to our roots in the New Testament, but it doesn't start in the New Testament. It goes back, that has roots that go back further into the inter something or other period, inter testamental period, which in turn has roots back into the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament. We, y'all, have really, really deep roots. We're not into flash in the pan stuff up here, right? That's, that's not what we do. Um, if God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, you can kind of expect some, some continuity, some similarity, some connectedness going back through our time period, all the way back through New Testament, intertestamental, and Hebrew Bible stuff. 
we're hearing about this, Genesis Apocryphon, we're hearing about this, at least in terms of what people thought between the Testaments and into Jesus' day. This goes all the way back to Father Abraham. I laid hands on him so that the scourge would be removed from him. So, uh, then Rabbi Chia shows up at Rabbi Yoda Nasi's house and he says, hey, how's your tooth? Evidently, it was well known that the guy was struggling with a toothache. And the guy responds, since you laid your hand upon it, it has been cured. There you go. The proof is it's right there in the pudding. Since you laid your hand upon it, it is cured, he responded. Now, I just kind of threw this up here because I always share my sources uh, like up here. You know, like the guys on TV don't. Well, the rabbis back in Jesus' day believed or practiced or taught. You never get an ancient text out of those guys. I'm wondering what's up with that. You ever wonder what was up with that? You know that every time I've ever checked, I've never been able to find it. That's the reason why they're not citing the source, because it doesn't exist. Be careful what streams you drink from. That's all I'm saying. Then we're going to move right on. Go ahead, Pastor. All right. Now, so we've, we've done our survey. We've done our review. We've looked at what's been going on with this business of healing, specifically this matter of the laying on of hands, and we found out it's not bizarre, it's not weird, and it's not new. We found that there are examples all over the place in the ancient world and not just in the New Testament or not just related to the ministry of Jesus, but it has this trajectory, this connectedness that goes all the way back basically to Father Abraham. I would suggest it didn't start with him either. More than likely, it goes back before that. That's just as early as we, can, we have it attested, testified to in ancient literature. So what we do, what Lacey and I are doing, traveling and you know, uh, teaching in Israel, and I've got an online international course right now through Jerusalem University College. Can't go to Israel right now because it's, it's just, it's very narrowly open for a set of pre-selected groups. There are 40 in the country right now and they got selected by lottery, but things are changing. They're watching what happens. Most of Israel now, they're up to about 80% vaccinated. Uh, they lead the world as should be happening. Uh, the, the, the God's people should be leading the way. Um, and it's just not some kind of a big political pitch either. I'm just saying, by the time it's time for us to take off in uh, March of 2022, Israel's going to be fully vaccinated. That means you won't be able to give it to them and they won't have anything to give to you. That's a good day at the office, y'all. Okay? So, um, but this is what we're doing right now. We are making every effort to put the Word of God back into its original context, whether we're teaching in Israel or whether we're teaching in Bella Vista, Arkansas, which was last weekend or some, I think. Um, and people love it because they're recognizing, hey, what I believe is not goofy, weird, bizarre, and just cooked up by some television preacher last week. We have deep roots. We have, we have really fertile soil. And I just want to encourage you guys Get in touch with context and you're going to see the Bible come into HD and, and high resolution and, and 360 uh, degrees. It's just in, incredible that um, we have all this stuff, archaeology, geography, ancient literature, ancient languages, ancient history, ancient culture. Um, we've got all of that stuff to tap into. Those of you who've already been to Israel, and we've done, what, four or five trips out of, uh, uh, with uh, New Hope already, you just grab one of those folks and ask them, what did this do for you in terms of your understanding of God's Word? What did this do for you in terms of your, um, uh, of your relationship with God? And how did this move you out into another level of spiritual maturity and of relationship with other people, of loving your neighbor as yourself? And let them tell you the story. Then you'll know whether you get enough bang for your shekel to warrant uh, doing that. For repeat folks, well, you already know what you already know. And that's, we'll just pile on more. 
It's just going to be more fun. But I want to stop right here and just say, it's all about, it's, it, it's kind of like real estate. What are the three rules of real estate? What are the three rules of Bible? Context, context, context.